a great exercise. Okay, then you can turn in your booklets to page 29. We made it to a new chapter. Uh, and if you're a visitor this morning or if you don't have a booklet along, there are a few booklets at the back here, these 1689 London Baptist Confession booklets. So gladly grab one uh, if you like. And you can keep it as well. Okay. Page 29, we are on the chapter on justification now, chapter 6, uh, and we will read it out and then we will work through it here bit by bit and assign the scripture passages as we go. All right. Chapter 11, section 1. Those God effectually calls, he also freely justifies. He does this not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and accounting and accepting them as righteous. He does this for Christ's sake alone and not for anything produced in them or done by them. He does not impute faith itself, the act of believing, or any other gospel obedience to them as their righteousness. Instead, he imputes Christ's act of obedience to the whole law and passive obedience in his death as their whole and only righteousness by faith. This faith is not self-generated. It is the gift of God. It's a lot of words, but a glorious, glorious truth. And if there would be one article, I mean, there's several, but if there would be one article in this whole confession that would say that the Protestant Reformation was necessary, it's this one. Okay? This absolutely serves as a dividing line uh, between the medieval Roman Catholicism and true evangelical faith. Um, and, as we've discussed sometimes in the past, the, the interesting thing is that some people, uh, on a podcast I listened to called The White Horse Inn, uh, they went to an evangelical booksellers convention. And uh, they read to pastors, evangelical pastors, they read to these pastors articles from the Council of Trent, which was Rome's counter-argument to this. And evangelical pastors were saying, not knowing what they were hearing, they said, that sounds too Calvinistic. Okay? Rome was too Calvinistic for modern evangelical pastors. Too much grace. Too much grace. There's got to be something that we contribute, right? Our decision or, or something that they contribute. So uh, th the work of Reformation is not a one and done. It is an ongoing thing that we must remind ourselves that it is by God's grace that we are saved and grace alone. Okay? We always want to inject ourselves back in. We always want to control our salvation somehow either with our actions or with our perfect doctrine or with our well-meaning intentions. Uh, but this is a reminder that justification is by grace alone, through faith. So the first article here is, those God effectually calls, he also freely justifies. And there, there's two texts here. Uh, who wants to take Romans 3, verse 24? Do we have a volunteer for that? Romans 3, 24? Jeremy? And then 8, verse 30. Who wants to take that? Keith. Okay. So go ahead, Jeremy. Romans 3, 24. Okay. So how much is Paul crediting us with our justification? How much Jeremy is in verse 24? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So God saves. God saves. Okay. And that sounds like we shouldn't have to say it, but just think about it. God saves sinners. That's it. God saves sinners. God saves sinners. Keith, chapter 8, verse 30. Very good. Keith, what is that chain sometimes called in the world of Christian thinking? Are you familiar? The doctrines of grace, yeah? Or the golden chain of redemption, right? One thing necessarily leads to the other. How many dropouts happen here, Keith? What's that? How many dropouts happen? Oh, no. <laughs> no. 
None. Yeah, there's no dropouts. The same group that Christ starts with, he ends with. Right? Those who are called are justified. Those who are justified are glorified in heaven. Okay? And Paul uh, even talks about glorification in the past tense. That's how certain it is. Okay? We're not in heaven yet, but Paul already says in the past tense we're glorified. Okay? That's how certain salvation is. There are not dropouts. Okay? If, if Christ has justified you, you are justified forever. Okay? Eternal life means life for eternity. Okay? Can you lose your justification? No, you cannot. You cannot lose your justification because it's Christ's work, not, yours work, not your work. And so the saying is true. If you could lose your justification, you would. Okay? If, it was, if it was up to us, we would lose our justification. 100% of us would. Okay? But perseverance is something God does in us, and so we cannot. Because this is Christ's work. Discussion on that. Does this make sense? Okay. Then let's keep going. He does this not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and accounting and accepting them as righteous. Okay, so what's this word of infusion? Why is that important? Uh, and we'll go back a little bit into history here again and talk about the language that was used. Um, at the time of the Reformation, of course, this was the most hotly debated topic. This was what the Reformation was initially about, was justification. Uh, and Rome said this. They said, if God counts people righteous because of the righteousness of Christ being imputed to them, Rome said that's a legal fiction. They don't actually possess that righteousness. So it would be a lie for God to say somebody is righteous who is not actually righteous. Okay? And to this day, I, I just listened to uh, James White and um, Trent, no, Trent Horn? Catholic Answers, whatever, it doesn't matter. Very good debate, very well done. Uh, and he, he uses this legal fiction language. Okay? The Protestant gospel is a legal fiction because God is counting Jesus' righteousness to a sinner and that can't happen because that's not actually their righteousness. So Roman Catholics talk about infused righteousness. So grace is like a thing okay, uh, that gets planted into you and as you cooperate with that grace, it's infused to you so you become righteous by your actions. Okay? So as you cooperate with grace, you get more and more righteous and that's what they mean by infused grace. Keith. Uh, no, there they would talk about imputation, which is why they're not quite consistent. And the other area where they're not quite consistent to say it's a legal fiction is we all know about um, indulgences, right? The treasury of merit, the saints, they stored up this, these surplus righteous acts. And the Pope, because he has the keys to the kingdom, he can credit that surplus righteousness to you and save you time in purgatory. The Pope has the power to impute the righteousness of dead saints to you. Rome does believe in imputation. They just believe in the imputation from the treasury of merit, not from Jesus Christ. Okay? But Rome very clearly believes somebody's righteousness can be credited to somebody else. We say, yes, that's about Christ, and they say it's the treasury of merit, and St. Anthony's cat can give you certain years off of <laughs> uh, purgatory. Okay? But this is a very important difference, and, and it's one of those things that a few words and a few letters can actually change the course of history. Because if you just think, well, imputed righteousness or infused righteousness, does it really, does it really make such a big difference? Um, and the blood of Protestant martyrs would say, yes, it's all the difference in the world. Okay? Either you are justified by Christ alone or by your cooperation with Christ. Okay? This is the difference between life and death. So yes, it is a big deal. That righteousness is imputed and not infused. And I'm not sure if I'm explaining that effectively or not. Do you see the difference between being credited or needing to cooperate? Do we see that difference? Does that, am I explaining that in a way that makes sense? Yeah, okay. It's kind of quiet here this morning. Uh, 
Okay, good. Um, okay, so infused means a quantity of something is put in you. So let's say... You may say too soon. I'm just thinking of an illustration on the spot here. Let's say if you get vaccinated for something, you are infused with the vaccine. And then those antibodies start creating more antibodies. Okay? That's infusion. And that's how Rome would understand grace. They're putting a quantity of grace in you, and you can make that quantity of grace go bigger by your cooperation. So as you cooperate with grace, you get more and more saved. Never so much that you know you're saved, but perhaps enough that you might guess you might be saved. Okay? But cooperation is key. Okay? And so in Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, we've discussed this before. That's why Jesus is still on the cross in a Catholic church. Because every week when you take those elements, Christ is being propitiated again. Okay? We're re-sacrificing, or it's a continual sacrifice, not re-sacrificing. In Roman Catholic theology, it's a continual sacrifice. Jesus is dying every week, okay? because sin is ongoing. This is never a once-for-all thing. And this is why you need to get baptized to remove original sin. And this is why you go to confession, and why the priest gives you things to do at confession so that you can cooperate with grace as you pray through your rosary beads. Or perhaps you make a pilgrimage. Or perhaps you do almsgiving. Or it, it, it's just this treadmill of works. And they don't see it as works. They see it as cooperating with grace. But it's clearly you on this treadmill needing to do things in order to make your salvation effective. Imputation says, no, it's just credited. God, God goes to his accounting book and he takes all this righteousness from Christ and he transfers it into the column that says Dave Weeb. Done. Okay? Another way you can put this is, in Roman Catholic theology, grace plus works equals faith. In Protestant theology, grace equals... Uh, faith equals... Grace equals faith plus works. I'll say that again because I mumbled it. In Roman Catholicism, grace plus works equals salvation, where it would say justification. In Protestant theology, justification equals faith plus works. Okay? Your works are a sign that you have been saved. They're not something that helps to get you saved. Okay? It's a fruit of what Christ has done. It's not something that you do to achieve getting grace back in return. Okay? I'm not sure if I made that worse or better. Uh, because the, the once-in-time historical event of the crucifixion is finished. But the, per the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass is ongoing. But they would just understand it strictly from a historical standpoint. Jesus in the flesh. It's enough if you cooperate with it. See, and this is different. And this gets very close to the kind of evangelicalism many of us have grown up with. <laughs> right? Oh, it's grace, it's grace, it's grace, it's grace. It's, it's all... But you have to allow Jesus to... And you have to accept Jesus. And you have to allow Jesus. And you have to give Jesus permission. Right? Who heard that? You have to give Jesus permission. Okay? What's that? And don't mess it up. Yeah, if you commit a... You know, no, we're, we're evangelicals. We don't believe in mortal sin. But if you sin bad enough, you will lose your salvation. Okay, so you do believe in mortal sin. <laughs> right? To a very large measure, evangelicalism has moved significantly back to Rome in very many ways. If you talk about people who are losing their justification or giving Jesus permission, okay, did Saul of Tarsus give his permission to Jesus to knock him off the horse? Okay? Permission is something that happens as a result of Jesus gaining entrance into your heart. Okay? 
um, so there's a lot at stake in this discussion, and uh, well, I'll maybe leave it there, unless there's other questions on that. Is it fair or unfair of me to say that to a large degree evangelicalism has moved back to more of a Roman Catholic understanding of grace? Does it seem that way to you? Or is that just me being a curmudgeon? Right, okay, so Margaret's asking, is there a difference between cooperation and obedience? And I'd answer, perhaps depending on what you mean, but the key, the key difference is between the Roman Catholic side and the Protestant side is for us, obedience or cooperation is something that happens after justification because your heart has been born again. Okay? Jesus made you born again, therefore you will cooperate, you will obey. And in Roman Catholicism, that's one of the preparation steps. Jesus will save you if you cooperate with grace. If you cooperate with Mother Church. Okay? Your parents brought you up for baptism, so your original sin is washed away, and then you do penance. Okay? And then maybe you'll get last rites, or, you, or maybe you'll get married, or maybe you'll be ordained. But there's all these steps of cooperating with grace that they would see as preparation. We would see it as fruit after the fact. You are born again. Now, therefore, with your new heart, you want to cooperate. You want to obey. But we would say that's evidence of something that's happened. Rome would say that's part of you preparing yourself to be saved. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Is this starting to come into focus, the difference here? This is important stuff, Lisa. Yep. That's right. Yep, you're preparing yourself. Yep. You're priming the pump for, so that Jesus has the ability to save you. Yep. Hugh. Hugh. Yes, that's, that's exactly it. So he just said, I, I don't want to miff it now. We, I'll just say it loud enough so everyone can hear you, so I'm not misquoting you. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's the difference right there between a Roman Catholic understanding of the gospel and a Protestant understanding of the gospel. Yeah. Why don't we look at these texts here in footnote two. Who wants to take Romans four, five through eight? Who's got that? Sean? And who wants to take Ephesians 1 verse 7? Ron? Okay, so Sean, what do you have to add to be saved? <laughs> your sin, yeah, that's what you contributed to your salvation. Sean Wake sucks. <laughs> you you kind of do, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> I like you, you're a great guy, but that's because what God is doing in you, right? That, and that's true. That's what we contribute to our salvation, is the sin that makes it necessary. This is all of grace, right? What Sean just read, it's all of grace. It really, truly is. Okay? It's all of grace. All of grace. And then Ron, Ephesians. Amen. Okay, so again, this grace emphasis is clear. Okay, and the Bible does have lots of instruction for 
how we ought to obey, but again, that is on the other side of salvation. That's an evidence that salvation has happened. That's not something to gain salvation. Sean. Off the top of my head, I'd say he does not impute faith itself for the act of believing <laughs> or any other gospel obedience to them as their righteousness. We'll get to that. But that, okay, so is faith a work? Is faith a work? No, it's a gift. Faith is something that is real in us, but faith is not something you produce by your will. Faith renews your will. Faith makes you new. It's part of the gift. And if you go through in Ephesians, you are in Ephesians uh, 1 there. Just go over to verse to chapter 2. Okay. Um, let's start in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. You could preach six sermons on this, but as pertains to this. It says, For grace you have been saved through faith, and this, in Greek, the this is neuter. So it doesn't match faith, which is feminine, and it doesn't match uh, saved, which is masculine. The fact that this is not your own doing is neuter is because both the faith and the saved are included in that. Okay? The faith that saved you is part of the gift of salvation. It's not a work you perform. Okay? It's, it's an instrument, and we're going to get into that in this clause later. Faith is the empty hand that receives salvation. That's faith. Uh, another analogy might be, if you've got a fridge that's not plugged in, and you grab the, the male plug at the end of your fridge, okay, does that plug produce electricity? No, it doesn't. But if you plug it in, it receives electricity. Okay? That's faith. It's not self-produced. It's the instrument that receives. Faith is the open hand that receives God's benefits. So it's not something I decide to have. Okay? It, and so when, that, when the discussion goes that way, well, yeah, but you have to decide to have faith. Well, sort of. Your will is changed by regeneration, by the new birth. But what does John 1 say? Let's go to John 1. It's like the Bible couldn't be possibly clearer on this, and yet we remain confused. Go to John chapter 1. I think it's maybe verse 16, 17. Maybe not. Maybe it's before that. Oh boy, where is it? Uh, yeah, but it's... Okay, no, it's sorry, it's verse... Let's go to... Uh, start in verse 9. John 1, verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, okay, so it's actually real people receiving this, okay, but how did they receive it? Who, re who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, 
Okay? So I'm not saved by my last name. Okay? I'm not saved by being a Jew or low German. Or we're not, this isn't by blood that we receive it. Nor of the will of the flesh. Okay? So this isn't something I chose to have and then God gave it to me. Nor of the will of man, but of... <laughs> So your so-called free will is only free because you've been born again. Before that, it was a slave to sin. It was dead, as Ephesians says. Okay? Dead men don't choose to come alive. Dead men are made alive, and then they listen when Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. Okay? It's really Lazarus being made alive. It's really Lazarus obeying. But when does Lazarus obey? <laughs> After he receives a gift that he did not cooperate with. Okay, Jesus wasn't pulling the rope of resurrection and Lazarus pushing. Lazarus didn't ask Jesus into his heart in order for this to happen. Lazarus is made alive. And then he wants to receive Jesus. He wants to cooperate. He wants to obey. He wants to choose accordingly. But it's all of grace. It's all rooted in the grace of God. It must be. I don't know how else you understand John 1. The freeing, the freeing of the will is a result of grace. It's not something that reaches out for grace. It can't be. We're dead. We love sin in our natural state. Dave. So you're asking or you're saying that the works that we perform after our salvation are also part of the gift. Yes. Yeah. And if we go back to Ephesians 2, I think you're on really good ground by saying that. Okay? So sometimes in our excitement for the gospel, we stop at verse 8 in Ephesians 2, but keep going. So not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? Justification is not the end in itself. God being glorified in his creation is the end. Justification is the means to that end. The reason God saves sinners is because he's making creation new. Okay? And he needs a new audience in that renewed creation, which is why justification is a step. Okay? It, and our good works are fitting with God's end purpose for his creation, which is that he's glorified, that he be all in all. That's right. That's right. And that would probably go back to the discussion we had last week is can an unsaved person do true righteousness? Right? And 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 the Bible says whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Romans 8 uh, says that those in the flesh cannot please God. Okay. This gift has to be given and then the works are a result. So we, there's, there's no way we can cooperate to get this. We cooperate because we have gotten it on the other side of our justification. So Protestants, in our excitement for the gospel, we should not downplay the importance of obedience. Not at all. We just understand obedience to be the fruit that comes after this tree has been planted in us. Sean. It depends. It would certainly refute the Roman Catholic approach to it, where it actually erases original sin. I think in evangelical, in Protestant 
reformational pedal baptism, you'd have a distinction between the visible and the invisible covenant. Okay? And we actually, even as Baptistic believers, have to make that same distinction. Not everyone who's here this morning, chances are, I don't have any names in mind, uh, can we be certain that even in a Baptist church, everyone here is born again? No, we can't. So we are also left making a visible, invisible distinction. Here's the visible church. Everyone here. Visibly, this is God's church. And if there's some here this morning that are not saved, we have to do the same thing and say there's an invisible church inside this visible church. There's truly saved people in the visible body of the church. And so to some degree, we'd have to make that same distinction. So I, th I think it would be saying too much to say that this would solve that question, other than if you go all the way, as some do, where um, baptism isn't a sign or a seal, but it's actually efficacious. Like in Roman Catholicism, where it actually erases original sin, that's saying far too much. But for an Anglican or a Presbyterian, uh, I think it would be from my standpoint, it would be proving too much to use this as a baptism text. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Maybe some. I'd want to give more credit there. And it is interesting that even churches that have the same confession can be very wildly different in the way they talk about things. Um, if someone is talking about baptism as though it's going to save, I would definitely take exception to that whether it's a Pato baptist or a Cradle baptist um, But orthodox Protestant views of baptism on either side don't and should not say that it's doing something other than that it's a visible sign or seal, right? And they would correlate it with circumcision for the Old Testament boys. Um, and even there when the Jews were circumcising their boys, nobody thought, oh, if you're circumcised, you must be true Israel. That was never what was supposed to be communicated. It's a sign for the true Israel inside Israel. And that's how evangelical pedo baptism would work as well. We're putting a sign on, we're, we're committing to raise this child as a covenant child in a Christian home. They may have faith later or they may not. We don't know, that's in God's hands. But I will grant, some pedo baptists do talk or the unspoken assumption that gets very unhealthy and bears very bad fruit. Uh, and I've heard this from some. Oh, they're baptized, they're, you know, they're covenant kids. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't like it that they're out partying and getting drunk. I don't like it that he's sleeping with his girlfriend. But at the end of the day, I mean, of course, it, if that's the mindset, then something <laughs> has gone very awry. Okay? If you're not living like a Christian, you need to repent. And, and come to the gospel. But I think most Protestant, evangelical, pedo baptism would not operate that way. At least not on paper. You may get a culture or, that's like that, but I'd want to I'd want to give more fairness on, on that on that one. But I, I have had those discussions with people. Oh well we're all such and such an ethnicity, therefore we're all saved. I can do whatever I want. And that's not good fruit. More on this. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think James, the epistle of James, corrects us from taking this truth and saying, therefore, good works are unnecessary. No, they're necessary as evidence. Right? Yeah, if you're seeing bad fruit, you have evidence that what you're looking at is not a fig tree, but a thistle bush. Okay? 
The fruit does tell a lot about what's happening inside of a person, not in a sinless perfection way, but, but regenerate people will bear good fruit, will. That's just, they will, right? In, in Romans 6, 1, when the objection comes, oh, well, then I may go on sinning that grace may abound, right? The, the old joke, well, I love sinning, God loves forgiving, this is a perfect, this is a perfect match. No Christian can think that way. And I would even be so bold as to say no Christian does think that way, at least not for long. If grace grabs a hold of you, your life will change. Not to get that grace, but as evidence that the grace has taken root. So James's correction on the other side is, is equally good. If you say you have faith, but it doesn't show up, that's not a living faith. That's not real faith. That's just something you ginned up in yourself or, or you thought of on your own. I, I gathered you want to say more, sorry. Did you? No? Okay. Okay. Anything else before we close this off? Yes, that clearly teaches belief is a work. And so, did I just contradict everything I said? No, no, keep reading. It's a work of God. Belief is a work. It's a work that God does in and through people. It's not a work I perform. God does the work of regenerating people and putting belief in their heart. So, the, the, the work part here is God's work, not man's work. It is a work. It's God's work. Why don't we bring it in for a landing then? Let's close in prayer and then we can have some coffee and move on. Father God, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for the gospel and thank you that it is a gospel of grace. It is a gospel of free grace. Lord, you work. Uh, you revive dead sinners to life. You cover us in the righteousness of your Son. Uh, and then you create a willingness and a happiness to obey, uh, to put sin to death and to walk in grace in our hearts. Lord, and so I pray that we would have a clear uh, grip this morning, a clear grasp uh, that our salvation is in owing entirely to you. There is nothing whatsoever in our hands that we bring. Lord, but our empty hand receives all your benefits. It receives justification. It receives glorification. It receives uh, obedience and good works that you prepared beforehand for us to do, that you would be glorified. Lord, and I pray for each one here this morning. Lord, assuming each one is justified, then I pray that we would see that the point of our justification is to glorify you in the way we live, in the way we approach life. Lord, and if there are any here this morning that do not know you in a saving way, Lord, I pray that you too would work in their hearts right now, that they would receive those benefits, that they would uh, gladly uh, take the righteousness that you offer, that you would cover us, that you would impute it to us, that we can stand faultless before your throne. Lord, and I pray for uh, anything in this discussion that has been confusing or distracting, I pray that you would set that aside, uh, but that you would drive the truth of your scriptures deeper into our heart. Thank you for this discussion, and I pray that you prepare our hearts as we move to corporate worship uh, this morning, that we would also gladly receive from your hand. pray this all in the strong name of Jesus, and amen.